All right, we are going to get into the long-term causes and the short-term causes of World War I. Why World War I all of a sudden happened? All right, so right at the end of the age of imperialism, uh, the, the war to end all wars is going to break out. All right, and there's going to be a really simple acronym that we're going to use to remember. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go Maine. It's going to spell Maine. Now, the other way you can remember it is that it spells mania, all right, because the, the addition there is going to be the short-term cause, which is the assassination, which there's an assassination that will take place, which I'll talk about uh, in a minute. So, uh, but the long-term causes, the easy way to remember is main, because I'm going to say this on the test. I'm going to say, hey, what are the main causes to World War I? That's militarism. The M stands for militarism, alliance, imperialism, and nationalism. We have our own little fancy acrostic right here all right, to help us remember it spells main, um, but they stand for each of these things. All right, so we're going to break down each of these as we go through this PowerPoint. Militarism, alliance, imperialism, nationalism. All right, so militarism is the glorification of war. It's the glorification of the military. Uh, countries competed against one another to see who had the most powerful military. Security at this time, meaning how they found comfort, was not in the fact that, hey, we can negotiate, we can solve problems diplomatically through, through negotiating. No, we can solve problems by carrying a bigger stick. We can carry bigger weapons. We can have a more powerful military, and then other countries aren't going to want to mess with us. All right, so that's what that was the mentality of these European nations at the time is because, man, we got industrial power now. Um, one of the most fascinating things about World War I is that all this new industrial technology is going to come about, all this new weaponry is going to come about, and nobody really has any idea how to use them. Uh, there's machine guns are now being created where instead of having a single-shot rifle, and instead of having a single shot rifle that can kill one person, you know, maybe maybe you can get or uh, you know a rifle, maybe you can kill like you know, six people in a minute. Well, now a machine gun can shoot four hundred bullets in a minute, so you can, <clears throat> you know, you can greatly increase. You know, we basically through technology, through industrial technology, we became a lot better at killing each other, uh, and that's going to become a major problem in World War One, where we're going to start to kill each other in really high numbers. Uh, that's why World War I was at first called the war to end all wars, because people thought there will never be a war equally as bad as this, except for 20 years later when there's a much worse one that breaks out. But at the time, it was, so, it was very catastrophic. But people building up their weapons, they were finding new weapons technology, and they were, they were building their military, having a strong military, a strong navy, and that's how they took their comfort. They said, nobody's going to want to mess with us. We are going to... Uh, we're not going to be pushed around. We're not going to negotiate. We're just going to take what we want. All right, so once again, and that, that ability to create deadlier and deadlier weapons is going to be uh, what's going to make World War I so catastrophic. All right, and we're going to talk a lot about this, how, how the war was fought as a response to all this new industrial technology. Because early in the war, you know, you can imagine the, the main, you know, a main part of people's military at the time was a, uh, a soldier on horseback, uh, the cavalry. Having a soldier ride in and take an enemy's position by horse. Now, you can imagine that would work pretty well if you got like 500 people on a horseback taking an enemy when they can only shoot one or two times in a minute, you know, or, you know, 10 times in a minute because you're moving, you're moving fast, it's going to be inaccurate. But against machine guns that can shoot 400 shots in a minute, that doesn't end well. And it didn't end well for a lot of them. All right, and so, so early on in the war, people still have horseback soldiers, and they're riding into battle against machine guns. You can imagine how bad that would end up. Uh, it's not going to end well, because you don't even have to be accurate. You're shooting 400. You get accuracy by numbers when you're shooting with a machine gun. But these countries would compete against each other to see, you know, like Germany wanted to have a bigger navy. Britain felt threatened by that because they have a large empire, and they wanted to have the biggest navy. And so these countries, instead of talking about their problems, they tried to build their navies up. All right, probably one of the great, more, more significant points is the alliance systems that are going to be established. All right, Germany, one thing that you have to know about these two is that Germany and France hate each other. That's why I drew this little graphic here. Arr, I hate you. All right, because some of the things that, you know, France, they, they fought a Franco-Prussian war. Germany used to be called Prussia. And they lost this territory right here that I have highlighted in red. And the, Germ the French are going to be mad about that, and they're going to want that territory back. Now, that we're going to come back to that. That territory is called Alsace and Lorraine. We're going to come back to that. But the French and the Germans don't like each other. And so in response to that, Germany knows that. They team up with Austria-Hungary and Italy to form an alliance. So we have three major powers in Europe all on the same side. So if France decides to attack Germany to take the land back, it would be like declaring war on Austria-Hungary and Italy at the same time. All right, so that is one rival alliance. It's called the Triple Alliance. You will have to know the name of that and who's involved. The, then 
France is going to also form an alliance. They're going to say, okay, well, to protect us from Germany now, we need to have an alliance. So if the Germans decide to invade, so France is going to team up with Great Britain and Russia. All right, so these are going to be their buddies. So now they're like, ha-ha, what do you think of that, Germany? All right, and so now you can see the Germans are putting a little bit of a bind because they got the Russians to their east, they got the French to their west. All right, so they're, they're putting a little bit of a bind by that alliance. But you can see why this is a problem. Right? Because European rivals now, all of Europe, in response to these alliances, they're going to be pitted against each other. Right? Great Britain feels threatened by Germany building their navy, Russians, you know, there's, there's all sorts of tension that's created. But if a spark breaks out, if a war breaks out between these sides, all of a sudden all these countries go to war. So if one country goes to war with another, now all of Europe is engulfed in a war that really might not have anything to do with them. All right, and there's a bunch of smaller alliances that are formed as well. It's like, uh, you know, all it would take, so these European powers are on opposite sides. They're pitted against each other. All it's going to take is a spark, and we're going to talk about that spark a little bit later. Uh, it's kind of like if you ever get in a fight with your friends. Here's my super awesome drawing. No big deal. If you get in a fight with your friends, uh, maybe you're mad at somebody else, and now all of a sudden your friends get involved with it because your, fr your friends want to have your back. And so even though like this, you know, these two people over here have nothing against these two people over here, they're going to, you know, they're going to be like, oh, I can't believe them. They're going to, you know, they're going to get into the, into the fray, into the fight a little bit just because they're getting this person's back, all right, or this person's back. All right, so, so this is how basically how Europe is going to, this is going to be one of the major reasons why World War I is going to start. It's because two countries are going to go to war, but it's going to pull all of them into war together. All right, and so, the, it, you know, if, like I said, you can equate that to, you know, if you've ever been in a fight with somebody, if you've ever had a friend that's like, oh, can you believe this girl? And all of a sudden you're like, yeah, she's the worst. And you don't even have anything against her, but, you know, maybe she did something against your friend, so now you don't like her or, or him. All right, and so uh, that's the alliance system gets established where uh, a spat between two countries now can involve many countries at once, and that's going to play a major role in World War I. So the alliance system is going to be a big part. Imperialism. It's going to lead to competition uh, because these countries, we talked about imperialism, it's when countries would go and take over other countries. Well, between European powers, they're going to compete against each other. They're going to want to take over more, more resources. They're going to want to take over more territory. All right. They almost go to war, uh, like Germany and France, because they already don't like each other. Now they're starting to, you know, the Germans are trying to take control of a uh, territory in, in Africa. Uh, you know, they're trying to take over uh, Morocco, and, and they're trying to supply weapons to the, to the Moroccans to get rid of the French. So they can rule there. And so the French are like, what the heck? And they, they, they're mad at the Germans. War almost breaks out. Britain has to step in and be like, hey, chill. Um, and so there's all sorts of tension created by imperialism. Uh, this territory, this is going to be important to remember. I'm telling you, I'm going to come back to that. It's called the Balkans. Um, this territory is going to, you know, people are going to want to take over this area. It's in southeastern uh, Europe. Uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to come back to that later, though. All right, then probably the biggest, one of the biggest motivations behind World War I was nationalism. These countries, once again, we talked about nationalism. It's wanting to be the best. All right, wanting, and we call it patriotic. Other countries call it nationalistic, where they want to be, they want, to be the best, um, but there's all different kinds of nationalism, ways nationalism affected this. One is that there was a huge desire for these countries to have self-rule. So before World War I, I'm going to pull in this map here. Before World War I, the, there was only really four major empires. There was the Russian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Ottoman Empire. All right, and so these empires, they included all different kinds of nationalities. There was the Poles, the Czechs, the Slovaks, the Serbs, the Croatian, the Czech. So these people are going to say, hey, well, we want to rule ourselves. We don't, we're tired of having rules levied against us that, that are unfavorable to us. So if I'm Polish or if I'm Hungarian, I want my own country. Or if, I'm, if I am Czech, if I am of an ethnic group called the Czechs, then I want to have my own ethnic group. So here's an example of the... Uh, just the different ethnicities, as you can see off to the side here, there's all sorts of different ethnicities that, that make up. So you have a lot of the, the Czechs are up in here, are part of the German Empire, the Russian Empire. We have the, uh, the you know, most of the, the um, Croats and Serbs are down here. We've got, you know, some of these other 
different nationalities popping up all around. Germans are in, you, know, you got a lot of Germans in Hungary, um, you know, et cetera. You have the Poles. You can see the Polish people is the purple. They take up a lot, a large part of the Russian Empire, and they just want to rule themselves. They don't. They're tired of being ruled by. You know, if I'm a Polish person, I don't want to be ruled by, uh, you know, a Russian. Uh, a Russian ruler who doesn't understand, you know, our customs, our traditions, our beliefs. So we want to have our own country. And so there's a lot of internal dissent happening because these countries wanted to rule themselves. Um, that, that desire to self-rule. Now the Slavic people, uh, I showed you a second ago, the Slavic people are going to be, um, they're going to want to create their own nation. Now Slav, it kind of sounds like slob. Or kind of like slave, but the Slavic people they want to they want to have their own country, all right. And so they want to create this place. It's called whoops. It's called Yugoslavia. I'm going to show you on this map here. Let me roll this up a little bit. All right. So here is where Yugoslavia is. It's in, if if you really look at the map right here, this is where Yugoslavia is going to end up going. All right. But they're like, hey, let's just create our own country. Let's get rid of Austria Hungary. Let's create our own country so that we can we can be free from like. By the Ottoman Empire, we can be free from Austria-Hungarian rule. We can have our, we can rule ourselves the way we want. All right, so this territory is going to be extremely important because Austria-Hungary knows that the Slovaks want to create their their own country, which is going to threaten their power. They, you know, they they're going to lose access to the sea. You can see the Adriatic Sea. Um, you know, they're going to lose access to the sea right here, which gets into the Mediterranean. It's a ma major trade route, all that stuff. Um, but the the um, the Austro-Hungarians don't want that to happen. So what they do is they're going to take over this territory. Now it sounds goofy and it sounds weird to say, and don't get too hung up on the name. But Austria-Hungary to prevent them from having that, they're going to take over a territory called Bosnia Herzegovina. I do like saying that. I'm not going to lie. So they take over Bosnia Herzegovina to prevent this nation from forming, this Yugoslavic nation where all the Slavic people can unite and form one. Austria-Hungary was afraid of that from happening, and so they are going to, they are going to uh, make sure that doesn't happen, and they're going to take over uh, that territory. And so there's going to be a lot of fighting that takes place because of that. They're going to be upset about that. Uh, and I'm going to come back to that. That's going to be important. Um, nationalism is going to feed into the pride of the people. Once again, everybody thinks they can win a war. Everybody thinks they're better than everybody else. Like you know, there, there's going to be a lot of people that think, "Hey, we can go to war. We're going to fight over resources. We're going to because of the industrial revolution. We want to have more money. We want to have a bigger, stronger economy. We want to have more territory." So this is it's becoming to the point where it's just not like a friendly competition. Like you know, in the Olympics, like as an example, I, I have like, everybody roots for the USA in the Olympics. If you're American. Uh, but it's getting to the point where now they're viewed as enemies. Like, no, let's take it from them. Let's get them. You know, let's get them back. And so nationalism is going to have a big part. Now, here's where the, the assassination, uh, this is going to be, so all that stuff is the long term. So between these nationalistic feelings, the internal struggle between these countries, the countries wanting to be better than others, you have the, the alliances that have been formed, the, the problems caused by imperialism, and then these countries just building up their militaries is going to, all be building up to the short-term cause of World War I. All right, the short-term cause is going to end up coming in the form of the assassination of one of the world leaders at the time. That he was the heir to the Austria-Hungarian throne. All right, so he is the next to rule Austria-Hungary, the country Austria-Hungary, their empire. All right, and so uh, basically what happened with all the nationalism the, that was building up, you know, these countries wanting to be better and, and wanting to prove it, the militarism where these countries are building up their military, producing all these new powerful weapons, uh, the alliance systems where European powers are pitted against each other, they don't like each other, all this stuff is basically just setting up the, all these feelings or, you know, these countries wanting to rule themselves. It's just setting the stage for just something to blow up. Like, it's just, it's something's bad's going to happen. And that's going to happen in the form of an assassination in uh, 1914. Now, Austria-Hungary had recently annexed, now that's just a fancy word for they added, they took basically incorporated this territory into theirs, the territory of Bosnia-Herzegovina. Whoops. All right, and so basically what that is, once again, if you, if you recall, I talked about Bosnia-Herzegovina, 
All right, is this territory right here. All right. Well, many of these countries, especially Serbia, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, Serbia, which is located right there, they wanted to create a unified Slavic state where all these Slavic people could rule over themselves. So basically they wanted their kind, their people, the Slavic people, to be ruled by Slavic people. They wanted to create a society where they weren't under the oppression of another of another um, ruler. All right, and so I told you that area in the Balkans was going to be important because this is going to create this is going to create when they took over this territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina, they are going to really create a lot of just bad feelings. A lot of people of Serbia are going to be ticked about that because they're like, man, we wanted that to create our own nation so we could rule ourselves. So it's going to really make a lot of people mad. Uh, and so as a result of that, um, Serbia, who actually is a, has a alliance with Russia, is going to, they are going to, um, well, I shouldn't say they're going to act out, but they're, they're basically friends with Russia. And remember, Russia is in a part of a, a separate alliance of the, Austria-Hungarian Empire, and so they're part of the Triple Entente, which is separate from the the alliance that Austria-Hungary is. And so, basically, when when the uh, ruler goes and visits, when the heir to the throne goes to visit Sarajevo, that's the capital city of Bosnia Herzegovina, right there. He's like, "Hey, I'm going to go check out our new territory. Right, I'm going to go see what our new territory is like. I'm going to go go check that out." Well, when that happens. When that happens, um, a bunch of Serbian nationalists, people that wanted to see a, a unified Slavic state, they're going to plot the assassination of this guy. And it's actually a really fascinating story because he, it was they had the car was all plotted out on where they were planning on going. Well, they threw bombs at the car. These assassins, uh, they called the Black Hand, um, and they were once again they were a terrorist group that wanted to see a Slavic nation. They didn't want Austria-Hungary to take that territory over. So they throw these bombs. The car goes off route. The car kind of travels off and finally goes to a place where he thinks he's fine and stops. He stops right in front of a 19-year-old terrorist called Gavarillo Princip. All right. And he's just sitting there, and he's out, he's out of position. The terrorists are kind of scrambling because they thought they could hit him with the bombs. They, nothing worked. Everything's kind of chaotic. And this guy just looks up, and he sees his target that he's supposed to get, takes out a pistol, shoots them both, uh, him and the white him, Archduke Francis Ferdinand, the heir to the throne, the next in line, shoots him and his wife, uh, and then he tries to kill himself by taking a poison capsule. Uh, the poison didn't work, so they end up capturing him. It was just—it was kind of a crazy, uh, crazy feat. And so, Austria-Hungary, you can imagine, they're ticked about this. You know, they—they they just lost the heir to the throne, was assassinated by Serbians, so they want to make Serbia pay. And so they're really ticked about this. So they give Serbia a 10-point ultimatum. Basically, hey, if you don't let us do these things, then we're going to war with you. Austria-Hungary knew they wouldn't follow all the ultimatums. They, basically, they said, we, we need to get access to all your government documents to see if, if this was a government job. And Serbia's like, we're not going to do that. We're not going to give you access to all of our top secret documents. So, so basically, uh, and the reason why they were able to do this, and this is really important, and a lot of people, we're going to come back to this, Germany is actually going to get blamed for starting World War I because the leader of Germany at the time, his name was Wilhelm II, the Kaiser of Germany, he's going to give Austria-Hungary a blank check. Now what that means is if, if, if somebody handed you a blank check, that means you can write in whatever amount you want there. Uh, and, and that's what basically you can do whatever you want. And so Germany's like, hey, if you want to go to war, let's do this thing. We're ready. All right, so... Basically, Germany gives them the okay since they're in the triple alliance together. Like, if you want to, if you want to go to war, we got your back. Let's do this thing. And so Austria-Hungary does that. And so Russia then, who has a bilateral alliance, a smaller alliance with Serbia, because they've always been a traditional protector of Serbia, they don't want Serbia to be attacked by Austria-Hungary. So Russia starts to mobilize their troops. Uh, and mobilization, I'm going to use that word a lot, it just means preparing for war. All right, so they're just readying their troops for war. Well, then Germany views, and this is where now the alliances are going to start to come into play. Germany views that mobilization as an act of war against Austria-Hungary. So bound by the Triple Alliance, they declare war on Russia. France, who has an alliance, an agreement with Russia, they see that and they actually de declare war on Germany by extension of the fact that they are declaring war on Russia. And so once again, you get... Uh, uh, he declares war, then they declare war because I have his back, then I got to go to war. Britain, 
officially joins the war when Germany is actually going to invade through Belgium. So Britain's going to hop in the war. And since Britain hops in the war and they have the largest empire, all the colonies are going to hop into a war because they're at war with, with each other. And so basically we have an event that happens between two countries. All right, we have the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne is assassinated by a Serbian. So instead of it being a small war maybe between the Serbs and Austria-Hungary, because they're, they're upset about this, where maybe a war breaks out, now all of a sudden, because that alliance system that was established, now that that alliance system, because of that alliance system, all these countries hop into a war that really they didn't have anything to do with. All right, and so those alliance systems are really important, a big cause for, for why the war is going to break out, because these countries just start going, uh, going to war with each other over the fact that a guy just gets assassinated. Uh -huh. And once again, and it's more than that, you know, once again, because there's the, you know, all the militarism, and there, all the tension that was built up in Europe for years prior between the militarism, the nationalism, the, you know, the, you know, the alliances, the countries have a lot of bad blood toward each other already kind of brewing. Um, but the spark that started it all was when the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne is assassinated because they took over territory um, that other people wanted, uh, and that's going to start. Uh, World War One. That'll be the event that sparks World War One. All right. And so we're going to talk. Uh, we'll talk about kind of what, how the war was fought. Um, we'll talk about the weapons of the war, uh, and then we'll talk about how it ended. We're not going to get a ton into specific battles or anything like that. But and so on.